Well, happy Mother's Day to all of you ladies out there. Amen. I'm not going to be speaking about uh, mothers this evening, but I'm going to be speaking about a mother's son. And uh, his name is Achan, it's a well known story uh, in the scriptures. And I'm going to turn to the book of Joshua to read this story and uh, find this story. Joshua chapter 7 in the Old Testament. I'm going to start reading at verse 1. And we read these words. It says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Cam, and the son of Zabdi, the son of Zedah, of the tribe of Judah, too, of the accursed thing. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Avon, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. And make not all the people to labour thither, for they are but few. So there went up thither of the people about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate even unto Beth, into unto Sheb Ai and smote them in the going down. Therefore the hearts of the people melted, and became <coughs> as water. <coughs> and Joshua bent his clothes, and fell on the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening time. He and the elders of Israel, and put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou <coughs> at, at all brought the people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns their backs before their enemies? <coughs> For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it, and shall environ us, or surround us, round and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore layest thou? Thus upon your face, Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even amongst their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. But sanctify the people and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee. O Israel, you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from amongst you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes shall come according to the families thereof. And the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households. And the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire. He, and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he has wrought folly in Israel. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah, and he took the family of the Zarites, and he brought the family of the Zarites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. And he brought his household, man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zedah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what you have done, hide it not from him. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and thus, and thus have I done. And when I saw amongst the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold, and fifty shekels weight, then I coveted them, and I took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and behold, it was hid in his tent, and the silver under it. 
And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua and unto all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had and they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire, after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger, wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. There's a story about a man called Achan, and it's an insight into the life of the children of Israel on this particular day. I'll just give us a little bit of background to this story just to show where we are at this moment in time in Israel's history. Moses had died, and Joshua had taken over as leader. And Joshua was leading the people <coughs> into the Promised Land. And they had a great victory at Jericho, the city of Palms. And everything went well, just as the Lord said. The walls fell down, the city came down with a great crash, and the Israelites went in, and they had a great victory. It was just like God said. God brought a wonderful miracle, and then children of Israel were on a high, a spiritual high as it were. And they were happy, and they were cheerful, knowing that their God was with them, and that all was well with their souls, and that they were now on the brink of a uh, uh, string of victories into the promised land. <coughs> But then we read this chapter and this story that we've just read. And it's about a, a man called Achan. And Achan, the name, very name means trouble. His name means trouble. And that's what he, Achan, brought to Israel, his brothers and sisters and all the people that he was with who had come out of Egypt and was with him, venturing into the promised land. He brought trouble to them on this particular day. However, if this story would never have happened, we wouldn't be here tonight, learning from the sin of Achan. Sad though this story is, and it's an awful thing for, to happen to Achan. But we thank God tonight that God doesn't deal with us as he dealt with these people on this day. So we can all take a deep breath and a sigh of relief that, that God doesn't deal with us in the way that he dealt with Achan. But nonetheless, we can learn from this story that God hates sin and God detests sin and God is a holy God and he must judge sin. And how God thought about this sin on that day, all those thousands of years ago, he still feels the same way about sin today in the year 2014. And though he may not treat us just like Achan was treated on that day, we may not be taken outside and stoned with stones and then everything that we have burned with fire as it as it did with Achan. Nonetheless, God still hates sin. And this is how he thinks about sin. God must always judge sin because he is a holy and a righteous God. The Bible says that we are a body. It says in, in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 27 that now you are the body of Christ. That's us. Those of us who have uh, given our hearts to the Lord and uh, forsaken habitual sin in that sense, we are now the body of Christ. He is the head and we are members of his body in particular. It says that in Corinthians. It also says, just before that verse, it says, if one suffer, we shall all suffer. If one suffer, we shall all suffer. Have you ever cut your finger on a piece of paper? You've been reading or anything like that. Yeah, of course, I've done it at work. I'm a painter and decorator by trade and I use shout knives for John's not what I'm saying, to cut through wallpaper called standard knives. And I remember once I, I, I was cutting across a piece of wallpaper. I didn't feel it at first, but a couple of seconds later I felt this terrible pain in my finger. I sliced through the top of my finger with this standard knife. It was so fine, the cut. I was looking to see what, what was wrong with my finger. And then all of a sudden the blood just started oozing out of my finger. I took, I took the top of my finger, not literally took it out, but cut through my finger. Oh, it was painful for, for all that day, and it was murder trying to put wallpaper on with a, with a cut finger. And for days after, my finger was so sore, 
It was so painful. But I knew in my head that I cut my finger. My whole body felt the pain on that day and even the days after. And it's like that in this situation. If one member suffer, we all suffer. The whole body feels it. If somebody's grieving, we all feel it, don't we? That we're part of the body, or we should feel it, if we're members in particular of that body, we should feel it. And it's only right that we should. But Achan, on this day, he took some stuff, it was gold and a garment and, and other things, and he took this uh, stuff which he shouldn't have took because God had told the children of Israel they were allowed to take some stuff, but then there was other stuff that they were not allowed to take. And so they knew exactly what they should have took and what they shouldn't have took. And Achan took something that he shouldn't have took, and it became called the accursed thing. But Achan took treasure, but we have all done just the same as Achan. We've all done things just as bad as what Achan did. Achan was a thief, wasn't he? He stole something, he took something that he shouldn't have took. We've all done wrong. The Bible doesn't give any degrees of sin. Sin is sin. So let us search our hearts tonight. Have we hidden anything in our hearts? I know, you know, the Bible calls this a tent, doesn't it? This body, it calls it a tent that we must put off one day. Well, I wonder if there's something hidden in our tent tonight. Like Achan did that accursed thing in his tent. Have we hidden something in our hearts tonight, in our tent, this body tonight? Have we walked in through those double doors tonight with something hidden in our hearts? that's displeasing to God. I haven't lived your life this week and you haven't lived my life this week. I don't know how you've lived and you don't know how I have. God knows everything about all of us. Amen? But I wonder, have we walked into the church tonight and we, like Abraham, have hidden something deep in our hearts. Maybe there's been envy there or jealousy or unforgiveness or something like that which God would call the accursed thing. Because the Bible says if we have something against our brother or sister, we should leave our gift here at the altar. Go and put it right, first of all, and then come and offer our gift. And I'm sure that all of us here tonight, at one point in our lives, have done just that thing. We've all felt like that or, or done that. We wouldn't be human, as that song said that Alison sang tonight. We're human, and we have faults, and we have failings. However, when God points some of our faults and failings out, We've got to acknowledge the fact that he's done that. And that he wants us to change as we sang in that song. You know, God's brought us into this room tonight to hear certain words so that we might change our lives. So we'll be different on the way out than we were when we came in. That those hidden things that are in this tent would be dealt with and that we would go out afresh, unburdened, and in the blessing of God. Amen. Because sometimes we walk into church and we don't feel as if we're in the blessing. You know, we have doubts and fears and all these things. Things come in and we don't feel as if God's blessing us in our lives. So God's blessing doesn't depend on how we feel, does it? He wants to raise us up to a higher place. Amen. And I hope that by the end of this word tonight, that's where you'll be and I'll be. Raised up through the word of God in our lives. What is sin? Sin is doing wrong according to God's law. Sin is falling short of God's mark. God has set a mark. His mark is the word of God. And if we fall short of that, well then we've sinned. We've done wrong. Now we accept in this world, don't we, that if people do wrong in this world, they're punished in some way. Either with a fine, or sent to prison, or something like that. We accept that as a society. We accept that that is so. And we see people go to prison every day. We see people getting fined every day. I got a fine not so long ago when I went to pick up my sons from the Liverpool Airport. A park where I shouldn't have parked. I saw this flashing light, it wasn't the law. <laughs> it, was, it was one of these Walmart cameras. <laughs> Hallelujah. And not many days hence after that, I got a, I got a fine of a hundred pounds for parking where I shouldn't have parked. But we can't sin in a vacuum. We can't sin and think that, that, uh, that it only affects us. It doesn't affect anybody else. When we do wrong, it does affect us, but it also affects other people too. 
And we mustn't be so naive tonight and think that if I do something wrong, it won't affect anybody else. It's just me that will get through it. It's just me that will suffer the consequences. No, sometimes, like in our story tonight with ACAM, other people suffer the consequences of the bad mistakes that we make, you and I make. We all make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. ACAM's mistake this day was to steal something. And we're going to be learning a little bit towards the end of this work of how that affects us today in 2014. So, God starts to talk to his people. He recognises that there's a problem, that they've gone to attack this city called Ai. They've had a victory, uh, the city of Palms, Jericho, and yes, that was great, and, and praise the Lord for that victory. But now they're moving on to the second town, and the second town was Ai. And they thought, well, you know, we did so well last time, we'll only send a couple of thousand men this time, we'll walk it, it'll be a piece of cake, it'll be a small town, we'll, we'll have them beaten in no time. <laughs> but they didn't realise that there was something wrong. They didn't realise that there was something wrong in the camp. They didn't realise that Achan had took the accursed thing. But God knew. But they didn't know. Why didn't they know? Well, Achan's sin in taking the accursed thing, when God approached Israel with the sin, he didn't say, Achan's done it. He said, Israel has sinned. <coughs> he was looking at the body collectively. Israel has sinned. You see, Achan, yes, he'd done the misdemeanor, he'd done wrong, but we've all come to suffer the consequences. As we are part of the body, as we are members of the body, we will suffer together, as it were. We will rejoice together, as it were. We will grieve together, as it were. And so, in Achan doing what he did, the body suffered collectively. And this is why God says, Israel has sinned. In the story that we read, it said that 36 men lost their lives. 36 men lost their lives. Now we can point the finger and say, well, that was Achan's fault. Oof. Look what you've done, Achan. 36 men have died because of you. But over in the New Testament, when they dragged the woman before Jesus and they said, this woman has sinned, what should we do with her? Moses' law said that we should stone her and put her to death. But what do you say? And they tried to trap Jesus, didn't they? And catch him out in the things that he said. And he just looked down at the ground, started drawing the ground on his finger, didn't he? And he said, let him who is without sin cast a first stone. You see, the story of Achan tonight that we've read shows God in his righteousness, in his holiness, in his judgment. There was no mercy for Achan that day, was there? Only because Achan acted the way that he acted. But now we're in the New Covenant, we're in the New Testament, and we see a different side of God's nature. A loving side of God. A merciful side of God. A forgiving side of God. A graceful side of God. You see, it's the same God. He's got all the same nature. He still thinks about sin the same way today in 2014 as he did all those thousands of years ago. But now he treats us in mercy and forgiveness. If we'll come in repentance and if we'll put the thing right in our lives. You see, we've got a part to play. There's something that we must do. Now, Achan would have found that mercy and that grace on this day that we've read this story tonight. If only he would have repented and turned and said to Joshua, it was me. I did it. It was my fault. Because he was given the chance, wasn't he? They were taken tribe by tribe, household by household, person by person. And while that process was going on, Achan had all the opportunity in the world to say, I did it. He could have spurred all that heartache for everybody by confessing his sin, looking to God's mercy, and he would have found that mercy. But Achan didn't find that place of repentance until he was caught out in the very act, as it were. So, we see a painful defeat at I because of what Achan did in choosing to take the accursed thing. 36 men lost their lives. Well, the first mistake they made 
as we read our story, is that they never sought the Lord. They acted in the blessing of yesterday. And that's not wrong to think of the blessing that we had yesterday. Yes, past glories are great, aren't they? And I love past glories. But what is God saying today? Amen? What's God's direction for us today? The first mistake they made, they never sought the Lord. They never sought Him in prayer. We don't read anywhere in that story that, that Joshua and the children of Israel pray and ask God's insight into the situation. Yes, Jericho had fallen, but now they're facing a different enemy. I. And so they needed new direction. They needed a new aim. A new vision. What they did with Jericho in the walls falling down, it's not going to be the same today because now we're facing a different town. And maybe this town isn't walled up to heaven like Jericho was. They didn't read God's word. They, never, they had the ark there amongst them, but they never took the trouble to find out what God was saying to them. Well, God did it for us yesterday. We'll just march right on in there and it'll be the same as that. Alas, it wasn't because Achan had taken of the accursed thing. So there's a lesson for us, isn't it? That we should always seek the Lord. We should always be abiding in God. As we're doing tonight, as we come to church tonight, that, that's, that's abiding in the Lord, isn't it? Abiding in His Word, abiding in coming to fellowship, one with another. This is how we, we find the will of God, isn't it? Because no, no, not one of us tonight knows the whole entire will of God. The Bible says that we look through the glass darkly. I don't know everything. I'll tell, confess to you that tonight. I don't. I don't know everything. Mel doesn't know everything. Pauline doesn't know anything. Tom doesn't know anything. We've got bits of wisdom, haven't we? And when we come together and work as a body, you'll be surprised how powerful that is. When we work together and put all these things together, yes, it works, doesn't it? But when we try to do things on our own, sometimes we come awry. Who killed Goliath? Was it David? Well, in 1 Samuel 17, verse 47, this is David's testimony. David says these words. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Now God needs somebody to work through, as we heard last week, how he used Deborah and mightily, didn't he? That was tremendous last week, wasn't it? And little David comes marching up through the ranks. All the others were terrified. We've got the first hand on one side and Israel on the other side and little David in the middle. And he's wondering what all the fuss is all about. And the giant was there coming threatening the children of Israel morning and evening. But do you know David wouldn't have got to the palace if he hadn't afforded his giants. And so tonight there will be giants that you and I should face and must face before we get to the palace. Amen. Before we get to the promised land, before we can rest at ease in perfect joy and peace and all the other things that God promises, there are giants to face while we're down here. Amen? And we never know what's around the next corner. I'm sure uh, if I'd have asked well, uh, a week or so ago, if she'd have thought that Tom would have been uh, landing in hospital this week, she would have said, no, never even, never even give it a thought. Who knows what a day may bring forth? We don't know. Unless we face our giants, we'll never get to the palace like David. But David confesses that it wasn't his might, it wasn't his power. Yes, he had confidence, and it's good to have confidence, but his confidence was in the Lord and not in himself. God just looks for a man that he can use, or a woman, as we heard last week, that he can use. He does the rest. His Holy Spirit works the miracles. His Holy Spirit works through us, but we've got to make ourselves available for Him to do that. He will give you into our hands. That was David's testimony. God will give you, the giant, into our hands. His confidence was in God. But in our story tonight, Israel's confidence here was in themselves and in past victories. They'd forgotten that God wants them to seek Him daily. And they marched out in the confidence of yesterday's victory. It's not long to have confidence, but let our confidence be in God and not in ourselves alone. 
After, after the defeat, after the 36 men had died, Israel went back to their tents, and I'm sure they were confused and confounded and wondering what's going on. And Joshua, the leader of the people, is flat on his face, and he's crying to the Lord, and there's a tinge of abandoning in the, in the Lord. Oh Lord, what have you done? What, why have you brought us out of Egypt to, bring us, to, to be defeated here and I? Only a couple of days previous, he's praising the Lord for the great victory at Jericho. We think of our weird people. What was that sound that Alison said? We're only human after all. Praising him one week before, now he's flat on his face, saying, Lord, what are you doing? Why have we had this great defeat? And isn't that just a picture of us all? I could put myself there if I don't know what. I always felt so, oh Lord, what are you doing? Many times when, you know, when something comes up in our lives, it catches us, doesn't it? One of the words, we're not prepared, and we're flat on our face, asking the Lord, what's going on? When really, nothing that far has gone, gone on that God can't put right. Amen? God never shuts himself in a box. God never puts himself in a place where he can't get out of the situation. Amen? In Joshua chapter 2, there's, there's somebody giving testimony, saying that, oh, we know that God is with you, the children of Israel, because your terror has come upon us all, and we all know that you're going to come in and inherit this land. And three times in, 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 the, in, in those chapters in Joshua, we read the same thing, that the terror of the Lord and of the children of Israel came upon the people of the land of Canaan. Well, it was different on this day when Joshua was flat on his face because now he's full of terror. And the terror's on the children of Israel. And we can't serve the Lord when we're fearful, can we? We can't serve the Lord if we're, if we're uh, frozen, as it were, in fear. Those of us who are drivers, and you've ever drove in the dark and you've come across a rabbit in your headlights, the rabbit just stands there, doesn't it? Sits there, just glares at the side, doesn't move, doesn't run to the left or right, just, it's just looking at the headlights. It doesn't do anything. Because it can't, it's broad like mesmerising. And sometimes we're like that because of fear in our lives and terror. But we can't serve the Lord in that condition because we walk by faith. Amen? When things go wrong, it's because God wants to put something right. Amen? When things go wrong, we should think how God got us through the last one. Was God faithful yesterday? Yes. God got us through. Well then he'll be faithful today. And he'll be faithful tomorrow too. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. Whatever happens, we're in good hands. Amen? We're not on the losing side. We're on the winning side. And yes, problems may come. Like this problem came here on this day. Achan took the accursed thing. It was a problem. But there's always a solution to a problem. Amen? So we have a painful defeat at I, and then we have a painful discovery in the fact that Achan was found out. He was the one who brought the trouble to Israel. So Joshua's flat on his face, and God says to him, get up Joshua, I'm going to start to put the situation right. Get up Joshua, I'm going to give you a plan on how to put this in right, on how to move on from this point. Yes, we've been defeated, yes, 36 men have lost our lives, but learn from this. And let's move on. Let's put this problem right. And he tells Joshua his plan for putting the situation right. Joshua was learning that, like it says in Psalm 66 verse 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. What does that mean? Well, it means that if we are praying to God, and there's something bad in our hearts towards our brother or sister, God won't answer our prayers. In fact, the prayers will just bounce off that ceiling and come right back down again. Because God won't hear us. It says there, doesn't it, in Psalm 66. And in other places. In, Psalm, in, in Isaiah it says, uh, your sin separates you from the good things that God has for you. The sin separates us. <coughs> okay, there's a problem. What's the solution? Well, God's already provided a solution. Over in the New Testament, in, in the letters of John, it says that... Uh, God has provided the way of escape in that he shed his precious blood for us. And if we'll confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us and cleanse us from all our sins and iniquities. Hallelujah. Isn't 
Isn't God a good God? The precious blood that was shed 2,000 years ago is still cleansing us today from all our mistakes, all the things that we, we, we meant to do, and all the things that we didn't mean to do. God's provision is there for every single one of us. We need not fear. Amen? God is for us. He's not against us. Even in times like this story tonight, God is for us. And yes, sometimes, like Mel's going through now, the way may seem hard and rough, but nonetheless, God is still there. Sin must be dealt with. Before Nehemiah could rebuild the walls, and those of us who are Christians tonight will be familiar with the story of Nehemiah and how God gave him the vision to build up the walls of Jerusalem. But before Nehemiah could do any building, his first job was to get rid of all the rubbish. And the rubbish has to be got rid of. Rubbish signifies sin. And before God can start to work in our lives, the sin has to be removed out of our lives so God can start building on a good foundation. He won't build with the sin in our lives. First he'll deal with the sin and then he'll start to change us into his image. Amen? After we've made decisions in life that brought about terrible consequences, we cannot start the blame game. Back in the Garden of Eden thousands of years ago when, when Eve took that fruit that she shouldn't have took, she started that, didn't she? She started the blame game. Well, what was this man? It was this devil. It was it wasn't it? Adam tried it, it was this woman. And sometimes we do that, we justify ourselves, don't we? We start to point the finger at whatever or, or make up an excuse. That's how we are, we're human. We do that sometimes. God knows. But he wants us to be honest. The thing that made King David great is that he confessed his sin. When caught out uh, in adultery with Bathsheba, he didn't say, oh no, it was Bathsheba. He said, I confess. It was me. I don't know. It's against you and you only have I sinned. He didn't blame anybody else. He took the blame himself and said, it was me. Isn't that a picture of our Lord on the cross? It wasn't anybody else. It wasn't their sin that brought me to the cross. It was me. He took all our sins, all our grief, griefs and iniquities. The same is true in the church, isn't it? If our church meetings aren't going the way that we think they should go, well, God's not changed. He's still the same. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's us that's at fault, if there is a fault anywhere. God is sovereign. In verses 10 to 15, God tells Joshua to gather the tribes together to find the guilty party. And Achan is promoted in front of all the people, brought out and said, it's Achan. This is the man. This is the one that's troubled Israel. Joshua's a good leader, and yes, he has his faults, and yes, he's flat on his face in doubt and fear and, and all the things, but you can see the blessing of God upon Joshua's life. Because he's dealing with Achan in a godly way. He's not saying, oh Achan, you idiot. Oh Achan, you fool or whatever. He's not, he's not dealing with him in that way. He's saying, give God the praise. Give God the praise. He's being merciful towards Achan. He's being loving towards Achan. Yes, Achan's done wrong. Yes, people have died because of Achan. But Joshua doesn't take the hard stand with him in that sense. That's the shepherd in Joshua, isn't it? Amen. And God is patient with us today. He's long-suffering. Yes, he's slow to anger, and he's swift to bless. This is our God, the God that we serve tonight. Adam tried to hide his sin. Eve tried to hide her sin. Achan tried to hide his sin on this day. God knows our sin, it tells us in Hebrews 4. God hates our sin, it tells us in Proverbs 6. God has a plan for our sin, I've already mentioned that, in 1 John 1 verse 9. If we'll confess our sin, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us and cleanse us from all our sin.
But God will punish our sin. It tells us in Galatians 6, verse 8. Sin hinders the work of God. This is why it's important to get sin out of our lives and out of the church. Because sin is a hindrance. In Matthew 13, verse 58, it says that Jesus could not do many mighty works to her because of the unbelief. Unbelief is a sin. We often quote that verse, don't we? God can do anything. But he couldn't work that day because of the unbelief of the people in the town. You see, sin is a hindrance to the work of God. We must get it out of our personal lives and we must get it out of the life of the church. Of the church. This is why we have the preaching of the word through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not my word, it's God's word. He'll do it. He's, he's the good shepherd. And he'll do it through his word. In 1 Corinthians 11 verse 31 it says, If we would judge ourselves, if we would look inwardly with time, as I said at the beginning, if we've come in with something hidden from God's eye, if we'll judge ourselves and say, Lord, I've got this here, I've got this unforgiveness, I've got this envy, I've got this jealousy, I've got whatever it is, if we'll confess it before the Lord tonight and put it right, we can walk out of this place with a new start. We can walk out on our souls, as it were. Amen? The burden has been lifted. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. We used to sing that song, didn't we? Burdens are lifted. And sin is a burden. It's heavy to carry sin. Oof. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. But if we would judge ourselves, God will not judge us because we will have judged ourselves. So, after a painful defeat at I, after a painful discovery that Achan was the sinner, or the one who brought trouble to Israel, then we have a painful death. Achan has to die because of what he's done. This is our God, he's a righteous God, a just God, a holy God. And this is how he dealt with sin in those days. I wonder how he deal with, with people today, if he dealt with them like that, if he was to do exactly like he did then. I don't think there'd be so many people on the planet today, would there, if God was acting like that today. God is not willing that any man should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jesus came into the world not to take men's lives, but to save men's lives. Remember the disciples, James and John? Lord, should we call down fire and, and, and consume them, Lord? No, you don't know what spirit you are of. He said, I've come to save men's lives, not destroy men's lives. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Praise God for that second part that verse. Amen? So, now comes this painful death. And sometimes, death could be painful for us. In what way? Well, if we're coming to this meeting tonight, and there's something hidden in our hearts, like they can have something hidden in his tent, if there's something hidden in our tent tonight, it's going to cost us our pride to get rid of it. Because now we've got to say, yes, Lord, I have a problem. And saying that doesn't come easy sometimes. Me. So is that turning out on something else? But this is how we are sometimes. This is how we, we, we act. It's always only a matter of time. The Bible says, be sure your sin and my sin will find us out. It says that in Numbers 32, verse 23. Yes, we can get away with it for a while. Yes, God may wait for a couple of days or a couple of months or whatever, but it won't always be that way. Because God must judge sin. He's a holy God. He will. So we can escape from his judgment for a matter of time, but not always. Be sure your sin, my sin, will find me out. Achan's sin is discussed with Joshua in verse 19. We see Joshua's compassion for this condemned man. And isn't that just like God? In Isaiah it says, come now, let us reason together. Let's talk together about this problem. Though your sin be as scarlet, it shall be as white as the driven snow. That's God's heart. Yes, there's a problem. Yes, there's sin. But God's desire is that sin is dealt with and that it be white as snow as if we've never done it, as it has never happened. But Achan didn't find that real place of repentance. It was only when Joshua actually pulled him out and said, it's you, Achan. 
That was the only time that he confessed. He had plenty of opportunity while the collecting uh, process was going on, but he, he showed no remorse in that situation. It was the same with Pharaoh, wasn't it? He had every opportunity while those plagues were smiting Egypt to turn to God and say, Oh Lord, I repent. I'll let your people go. But he didn't. On and on he went through ten plagues. And then he chased after the children of Israel, didn't he, into the wilderness. And finally, the water of the Red Sea came right over him and drowned him. And all the people that were with him. Balaam too found no place of repentance. Judas also found no real place of repentance. These people all went down the same road. They all had the chance to say yes, it was them. But they never found that place. The Bible says in Proverbs 28 verse 13, he who covers his sin, in other words, he who hides his sin, he who doesn't acknowledge it before God, he shall not prosper. But it says then, but he who forsakes and confesses his sin shall find mercy. You see, if Adam and Eve had done that way back in the garden all those thousands of years ago, it might not have been the way that it is today. If they had recognised that God is merciful and loving and, and gracious, slow to anger, instead of hiding from him and not confessing the first sin, things might have been different today. But notice in our story the progression of sin and how sin works. And it's still the same today as it was all those thousands of years ago. Still exactly the same. The way sin works, it's just exactly the same today. The first step was Achan saw the thing. He saw it. He saw the treasure. He saw something. The next step was that he coveted the thing. He wanted to have the thing. And the next step was that he took the thing. Does it sound familiar? Back to the Garden of Eden again. Eve, she saw the fruit. She coveted the fruit. It would make her wise. She took the fruit. Think of David up on that roof when he should have been out battling with his men. What did he do? He saw Bathsheba. He coveted Bathsheba. He took Bathsheba. Sin is exactly the same. Doesn't matter what year it is, 2014 or 800 BC. It's just exactly the same today as it was way back then. See, covet, take. Satan's crafty, isn't he? He's very good, getting us to look at things with our eyes, to cover, to think about it day in, day out, until we finally take the object of our desire, or of our lust, I should say. James said it like this, in James 1 verses 13 to 15, Let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. God has done this tempting to me. No. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. It's our own lust that draws us away from God and from God's paths. It's not God's lust. It's not somebody else's lust. It's our lust. Achan lusted treasure. I wonder what we're lusting after in this meeting time. Power? Position? I don't know. There could be a myriad of things, couldn't there, that we lust after and want to take and grasp. I saw it in the business world, people climbing over people, treating people like dogs to get to the top, as it were. Do we think that it doesn't happen in churches? Hmm. You've got to be naive to think that it doesn't happen in churches. It happens right here in God's house. Turn to the book of Ezekiel and see what chapter 13 says about what the children of Israel were doing. They looked to all kinds of normal. So let's not be naive tonight to think that, oh no, it doesn't happen here. It happens here. Satan is just as crafty today at moving people to do things as he was all those thousands of years ago. But notice something else about the sin of Achan. It didn't stay still, did it? It progressed. It didn't just stay at, it, uh, at one level. It progressed to something worse and something worse. So it was with the sin of David, wasn't it? First he took Bathsheba's wife and then he murders Bathsheba's husband to keep what he's got. You see the progression of sin? It gets worse. It doesn't regress or stand still. It just goes worse and worse and worse.
Do you know what we should do? We should do like Joseph did back in the book of Genesis, chapter 39, verse 12, when Potiphar's wife came to him and said, come and lie with me tonight. Come and uh, lie in my husband's bed with me tonight. Joseph turned away and he ran. He fled from sin. That's what we should do. We should turn away from sin. When Achan is caught, he then tries to lie and justify his way out of sin. As I said, not like King David, who conf confessed his sin before God. Achan could never use what he put in his tent, could he? He put that treasure under the sand in his tent, but he could never use it, he could never take it out. Because everybody had known, oh, cool, that's, what are you doing with that? So what did he take it for? What was he going to do? What was that treasure going to do? It wasn't going to do him any good. It was just going to be hid under his tent. And it's going to be an awful thing because he's going to have to move the tent all the time and he's going to have to hide this treasure in his, in his bags, uh, in his tent all the time. So from camp to camp, he's going to have to be playing the hiding game. So what use was it to make out? Really, he stole for no reason whatsoever. It cost him his life, it cost other people their lives. What use was it anyway? The devil's very good at getting us to look at things, isn't he? Glittery things. Oh, look how good this will be for you. But he never tells you the consequences that will befall you if you do that then. And there are always consequences to sin, aren't there? So then we see a very public execution of uh, Achan. He doesn't only lose his life, but his family and all the goods and everything that he has are stoned to death and then burned with fire. Terrible, tragic, awful. But this is the nature of sin. It doesn't pick out any, any favourites, as it were. It affects us all, doesn't it, in like manner. If we sin tonight, if we're in this place and there's sin in our lives, we are heading for trouble, that's for sure. Just like Achan, we will be heading for trouble. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, verse 15, that the way of sin is hard. And if we do wrong things, it's going to be a hard road for us to walk down. So, to finish with tonight, what am I saying? Well, I want to go back to where we were last week with, with Brenda. Sometimes we're ready for the big things, aren't we? We're ready for the big problems. We've got the armour on, we've got the helmet of salvation, we've got the sword of the spirit, we've got the shoes on, the belt, all these things. And we're ready for when, when the devil comes as a roaring lion. We're ready for him, we're waiting. But sometimes we're unaware of those little foxes that spoil the vineyards. What did Brenda say last week? Those little things. The little things in life that trip us up. And yes, so often, more than not, it's the little foxes, it says in Song of Solomon, that spoil the vineyard. What do we mean by the little foxes? Well, the little problems that we have in our life, the little bad habits that are displeasing to God. And you may think, well, look, the little bad habits, not. Not much harm. What, 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 what harm can a little habit be? Well, let me put it to you like this. A flea is a tiny little thing. And you put that flea on a dog, and it won't cause that dog much harm, but it will still be there. It may cause that dog to scratch an itch now and again. But you know, that flea is going to have sons, and it's going to have daughters. There's going to be other fleas. And before long, all those fleas will infest that dog. So finally, the dog is going to die because the problem has not been dealt with. Those little things have not been dealt with. Just like Brenda said last week, those little things. And you think to yourself, well, what can a little, what? A little thing can't be can't, 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 can't that bad. But if like that flea, it can kill a dog. What could it do to a Christian? You get enough of those little bad habits. You get enough of those little uh, bad things in our lives and it will bring us down too. It will... It will alienate us from our God because God won't be happy with the sins that are there in our lives. Let me put it to you in another way to show you the importance of why we should stop sin in our lives. And in particular, this sin that we're talking about tonight is called theft. He stole something that he shouldn't have stolen. It was theft. He was stealing from God. Back in 2001, a man called Steve Wright Stole 80 pounds. And you may be thinking, well, oh, it's not such a bad thing that people have stolen more than that. The greatest thing I've stole millions. 
And it becomes sex. It's not a lot, is it? 80 pounds. It's not, not a lot. But that was the first recorded misdemeanor or crime of a man we now know as the Suffolk Strangler. His first sin, as it were, was an £80 theft for stealing money which he stole to pay off some debts that he had in his life. Let me show you the progression of sin. Only five years later, because his sin wasn't dealt with, this man, Steve Wright, has now murdered five prostitutes. So from stealing £80 to murdering five prostitutes. And we may think, well, it's only a little thing. But if those little things aren't dealt with, sooner or later these little things turn into snowballs and they come rolling back on us and they're going to crush us and bring us down. That's why God was saying to us last week in that message that it's important that we deal with the little things. Steve Wright, I'm sure he didn't even give it a thought when he stole 80 pounds. He wouldn't have thought that in five years' time he'd be murdering five prostitutes. But that's how... And I, I, I'm sure it started even before then, maybe as a child. He might have stole sweets from sweet shop. Or something like that. I don't know. I don't know how it started in his life. But if we don't deal with those little foxes, they will come in and they will spoil the vineyard. And they will bring you down. And they will alienate you from your God. So yes, sin starts small. It may start as only a small thing. But it won't stay there. It will grow and grow and grow. In the New Testament it says, a little leaven in the batch will spoil the whole batch. This is why God brings his word week by week to, to cleanse us from the things that we do wrong. God is the one who is changing us. So, tonight, when we think of Achan, when we think of this sin that he committed, this theft of the accursed thing, let's think also of these other things that we've spoken about tonight. That, yes, it may only be a little thing, but those little things can multiply. And just like those fleas on a dog, they will eventually bring us down. And 